one of the apostles who sh uh, showed his love towards his Jesus, towards our Savior, was John. When he was called by Jesus to become his disciple, he was a very young person. And perhaps being very young, and perhaps not being molded or being kind of a mature man with already established habits, he maybe was that easiest to be molded after Christ and to reflect his character. And when he became an experienced man in life, already after his 50s, he started to write letters. And in one of his letters, his first letter, and chapter 2, we read from verse 15. He says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. John wrote, and if you read a couple verses above in this chapter, he says, I write to you fathers, and I write to you young men." So he was writing to all generations. And as a sum of his admonition, this particular part of the letter, he says, love not the world. Because if you do love the world, then the, Father, the Father's love is not in you. Not that the Heavenly Father doesn't love you. No, He still loves you. But the problem is that His love is not abiding in such a person. When John was saying, love not the world, he specifies himself for us to easy to understand what he means by saying, do not love the world. In verse 16 he says, for all this is in the world. And now he lists the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. 1st John chapter 2 verse 16 when we discuss about these things which are in the world and all these lusts and pride and all this vanity of the world do you think we as Christian may be affected by this the problem is that that's the reality we are affected we are coming from that world and we are to leave the world behind and find ourselves completed in Jesus. But I would like to go more into details and see into practical application of this uh, John's uh, admonition and his uh, advices, brothers, fathers, Young men, mothers, children, grandmothers, don't love the world. That's what John is calling us. And he is pointing the lust of flesh, the lust of eyes, and pride of life. In the same book of John, but chapter 5, verse 19, we read. 1 John 5, 19. And we know that we are of God. And the whole world lieth in wickedness. So how he calls all this which is things of the world? Wickedness. I mean, it's something clearly marked that if you stick with that, you have no salvation. Because that is wickedness. Can a Christian be a wicked person? If we take Christian as just a name, yes. But speaking of a true Christian, no. Should not be. I mean, it cannot work together. Ephesians chapter 2, 
Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 2 to 3. Wherein in time past. So he's speaking to those who were converted once. In time past, ye walked according to the causes of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. So who is leading this world? You remember Jesus said, the prince of this world cometh, but has nothing in me. The same should be our declaration. Satan is coming, but he has nothing in me. But unfortunately, apostles were writing these letters. Now we are reading the letter of Apostle Paul. He basically repeats the same, just in different phrases. The prince of this world, he is a leader of this world. In the past, you were under his dominion. Verse 3 among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now, I have a question. What is the lust of flesh, a lust of the eyes? What is pride of life? What is lust? How would you describe lust? I'm asking you. I'm expecting desire. a question. Desire. Unlawful desire. Unlawful desire. Okay. Strong desire. Inappropriate desire. Well, Let's, let's read a couple Bible verses which clear, clearly mark what is lust. Psalm 78, verse 18. It's speaking of a history of the people of God, the old Israel. Psalm 78, 18. And they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. First of all, where the lust begins? It says they were tempting God where? In their heart. And what was in their heart? Asking meat for their lust. Can we call uncontrolled appetite a lust? Yes, it is a lust. So if appetite controls me, then I'm still a slaver of lust of the flesh. We are to control appetite, not appetite to control me. I would like to read something very important, especially for the young people. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23 to 25. Proverbs 6, 23 to 25. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. To keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman, lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids what's wrong with a beautiful woman you see Solomon brings here actually he, he, he describes he his own problem because that the, the women became a, he, uh, caused his failure and he writes, young man, listen, please listen to me, young man. Don't be stupid as I was. Don't be deceived. But is it something wrong with a beautiful woman? No. There is nothing wrong. But let me tell you, it's a real story. Um, about eight years ago, in one of the conferences, I met a young man. Very good young man, very promising as, um, in, 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 uh, from the perspective of being a, maybe a Bible worker and a future 
you know, dedicating his life for the Lord. Recently, on one of the conferences, I met him again. And I saw him with a little child. He says, wow, you know, the last time I saw you, you were not even married. And now you have a child says, oh, now I'm even divorced. And he told me his story. And it just immediately clicked with this Bible verse. Last not after her beauty. Because the lady he chose as a partner was not a God-fearing woman. And this is the admonition. Last of the eyes. You see... You fell in love, God, may thy will be done, but this lady be mine. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> this is a lust of the flesh. This is a lust of the eyes. And it's kind of connected. Because you see, it begins with the eye. You see it, or not necessarily eye. You know, it's not uh, mentioned, and nose here is not mentioned, but you smell it, and you want it. So if you have problem with some food, don't put it in your, don't store it in your refrigerator. Because you see, the problem begins having it at home. One lady, she tried to control her appetite. And she, on a refrigerator, there was a note she wrote, I am not eating after 6 p.m. After a week, husband wrote a little note. After 6 a.m., he, he corrected to a.m. Because she was, that note didn't help her. So what's wrong? Lust is a very strong. Passion is a very strong. And the worst is that this is our nature. We've been born with these lusts. We have them. We inherited these passions. In Matthew 5, chapter, uh, chapter 5, verse 28, well-known words of Jesus, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. But not necessarily a woman. It can be the opposite, a woman looking at men. It can be looking at a food, looking at a drink, looking at a movie, wrong movie, looking at a, uh, these worldly TV shows, looking at something, desiring this satisfaction. It's not necessarily satisfaction uh, of a uh, sexual passion, no. It can be satisfaction uh, or desire for amusement. Satisfaction for, uh, you know, why people read those detective stories. It satisfies a certain lust. Why people read romances. It satisfies a certain uh, type of a lust. Why people crave for certain food. That's their lust. Now, Johnson al John also mentions the pride of life. What is pride of life? Matthew chapter 5, verse 46. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans do the same? When I am good towards somebody who is good to me, or doing a favor for somebody who did a favor to me, is it something unusual? Is this what you call Christian? Just says, no, the people in the world do the same. Do them a favor and they will do, pay you with a favor. What is Jesus calling us? Love your enemy. Well, it sounds kind of abstractive, you know, love your enemy. Let's go, I, I want to give you a very practical question. Now, parents, that's especially for your question. When you feel more 
hurt it. When your father and, and mother, this is a question for you, when you feel more hurt, when you are offended by a sharp word from your child, or you are offended by a sharp word from your spouse? That's my question for you. When you feel more offended, when your son or daughter answers you in a sharp manner, or when your husband or wife offends you by a sharp speaking to you? Child. I, I was actually expecting different answer. Because <laughs> children, we as parents, we forgive them sooner than spouses. Why? You know the things which I said to my mother, she didn't, she didn't show any signs of being offended. And when the very same things I would say to my wife, she's offended. Question, why? Because my mom had me under her heart here. That's her dearest child. And when your children, even small children, when they say in a certain manner, you try to educate them, you're not offended. Because you understand that your children still don't understand something in life. Now let me ask you another question. When you feel more hurt, when uh, somebody from the world, your boss at work or somebody in the store, hurts you with a word or with an unpolite manner, or when a brother or sister in the church be, uh, hurts you with uh, some unpolite manner or word. When it hurts more? Church. 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 Why? They know better. Hmm? They should know better. But let me ask you another question. What is pride of life? If I'm hurt by brother Joe, what is that sign of? What is it telling others, you who are observing me being mad and offended? What do you think of me? Brother Gennady, you better learn to control yourself. I mean, you better go to Jesus because Brother Joe didn't say anything wrong to you. I mean, people from... you Look at yourself. I believe everybody found himself being in a situation that you observe a conflict and you see that offended or the victim, or who claims to be a victim, is not actually a victim because another person didn't have any whatsoever bad intention to hurt him or her, and he didn't say anything really wrong, he just pointed to something what needs to be corrected. And another person makes out of it a big deal, and it's offended, and all the emotions. And you see, actually, not the person who told is the f at fault, but the person who should receive this counsel in the Spirit of Christ doesn't have actually the Spirit of Christ. And it's a sign of a pride coming up, boiling. You know, when you... Uh, I was reading a story... Uh, Somewhere in, I don't remember the city, but in Russia, they have these uh, many store buildings and they have another separate building where they have these heaters. And through the pipe, the hot water go, go, goes through all these apartments in a five-story building. And uh, the, there was a valve, safety valve. And that somehow, that over the years, many years, got rusted, and it was not working properly. So uh, the man who was taking care of all this, because it's huge room, you know, it's uh, huge, you know, uh, very powerful heaters. And one of the heaters was had a water inside, and a valve was broken, was not working anymore, and he was a little bit drunk and that heater exploded. So actually when he came back from his lunchtime, the heater was three kilometers away from that building. It burst and it made a hole in the wall, brick wall, 
and fly three kilometers away. That's how a powerful, uh, you know, boiling water when it doesn't have a space to release. Somehow like that, people, some people behave like that. They end up in divorce from a little nothing. Because something is getting, getting rusted over the years and they don't pay attention to their internal needs and their pride is there. And it's boiling, it's boiling. And the moment comes and a husband or a wife doesn't air a mistake or say something or they maybe came back from work in a bad mood. And what do people say? That's enough. That's enough. That's it. I cannot bear anymore. And there's a big explosion and there is a divorce and there is tears and uh, children, poor children, they neither with a mother, neither with a father and they end up in disaster. And that's because pride could not be overcome. This is the pride of this life. And if you think that because you're sitting in these pews, you have less pride, you are absolutely wrong. The only way you can have less pride is because he lives it's through Jesus Christ. The point here that Apostle Paul also says that there is something in this world. Titus 3, chapter 3, verse 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Everything what Paul describes here is actually at the base of all these wrongdoings is pride. Why people hate one another? Because they cannot forgive one another. Why they cannot forgive? Because of pride. Why there is envy? Pride, you have, I don't have it. Hate one another. Disobedient. Why children are disobedient? Please do that. I'm not going to do that. What is that? It's pride. I remember one time, Juliet came from violent class. And somehow, uh, she was late with the uh, teacher. Somehow with the teacher, they got delayed. And a new student came, about the Juliet's age. And Juliet reported to me, Dad, if you would know how that uh, little boy was behaving. And her report says when she, he took a violin and he came with his mother and uh, that somebody, teacher or mother says, okay, take your violin and start playing. Says, I'm not going to play. And she says, well, you came here to play. If I said I'm not going to play, it means I'm not going to play. A child speaks to a parent. What is that? It's pride. I will not give up. I will not give up. Even I know I'm doing wrong, but I will not give up. I will not give up. You see, we are born with this. It's uh, some, somebody inherited more of this, somebody inherited more of the other. Somebody has more problem with overcoming appetite. Somebody has more problem with pride. Somebody has more problem with the lust of the eye. You know, he's after woman. Somebody is, uh, his lust is romances and all these TV shows. So everybody has more of something. But we all got this. Either we inherited or we developed due to some errors in education or the um, people we associated with. But we have it. Now we are called. John is writing to us. My dear, my beloved, do not love the world. So everything what we were talking before, this is the world with its lusts and pride and the wickedness. Don't love that. It's easy to say, hey, don't love that, don't love that. 
but practically, how can we fix this? So do you think if I'm speaking to you, I have no love of the world? It's a constant battle. If we read in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17 and 24. Galatians 5, 17 and 24. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Verse 24, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with their affections and lusts. Where is the solution? We'll go more into details, but briefly speaking, where is the solution? Those who are of Christ, they crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. But the problem is that this is an ongoing battle. In spirit, reading the Word of God, or even listening to my sermon today, you may, you may uh, come or leave this church with a certain decisions. Okay, I'm going to overcome that. I'm, I'm going to quit uh, drinking Coca-Cola. I'm going to quit eating that. I'm going to quit watching that show. I'm going to quit playing gambling, games, whatever. I'm going to quit something. You may make a good decision today. But Satan is not in agreement with your decision. He will not let you go that easy. And Apostle Paul writes, it's a constant battle. In your spirit, in your heart, you make a good decisions. But you are still in sinful flesh and it will desire what it used to get before. So if I had my drink, if I had my meal, if I watched this before, if I went there before, if I was reading, listening to that kind of music before, today I make a good decision, but tomorrow I will want to do it again. And there is a battle and says, and this flesh and spirit are contrary the one to the other. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? What we need, what we are lacking, that our mind to be renewed, to be updated. Raise your hand. Who has a computer, laptop, uh, any, any gadget of this operating system? Raise your hand. Basically, all of you. Now tell me, do you update once in a while your operating system? Either iOS or whatever you're using. Windows was uh, Windows 98, then was Windows 2000, then was Windows 1995, then... Uh, oh, sorry, 95. 2005, then 2008, and so on. And there was a Macintosh operating system. And that was older, and it was a lion, leopard, uh, Yosemite, and it's so on. And you're constantly updating. Why? There is always improvement. Something is they're improving, or this works better. There were requests from the users to have that and to have that, and they're updating it. We need to update our brain. How we update our brain? How we do update our operating systems? Before we were getting a CDs or DVDs, now we download from internet. Where do we get our updates for our brain? From the Word of God. And very often, listen carefully, very often we fail to a temptation and we are defeated by a certain lust because we do not spend enough time reading and studying the Word of God. 
no, not in lacking prayer and personal studies. And this is where, why we are weak. How can I be a good warrior, a strong warrior? Now imagine, now I'm taking tomorrow in a helicopter and dropped somewhere in there in Palestine in a desert to fight some terrorists. What will happen to me? I have no training whatsoever. Now, do you play piano? Now go and play piano. Ah, you see, you cannot do it. Mikey, you play cello. Can you play piano? Why? Now you see? How people play piano? Practice. Practice. How you get a trade? You go to school. You, 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 you need a training to be a driver, to be a nurse, to be a, a, a good salesperson. You need a training. We need a training from the Word of God. Ongoing training. It's an ongoing battle. Therefore, we need everyday prayer, efforts, prayer, efforts. Studying and trying to apply it in our daily life. If we do not overcome lust, the lust will overcome us. Actually, uh, let me correct myself. We are already overcome by lust. This is our nature. We are already into lusts of this world. They don't have to overcome us. We are already under their dominion by birth, by default. Only through Jesus Christ we can overcome them and be above the wickedness of this world. In Psalm 78, we, we read a Bible verse from there, but let's read one more. Psalm 78, verse 18 and 19. And they, means people of Israel, tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Now listen carefully in the next Bible verse. Yea, they spake against God. They said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? The unbelief, the murmur, is a result of a lust. If we hold to a certain lust, either appetite, either we like to watch something or to listen to something or do something, if we hold to that lust, that lust will plant doubts in our heart and we start question God's justice and mercy. I met so many people a person says, prove me from the word of God that alcohol is, I have to quit alcohol drinking. And I read him quite many Bible verses. And he challenged me with the every Bible verse. And says, look at that, look at that, and uh, look at that. Uh, what you say that Paul didn't mean the real wine, you know, how do you believe that it was not real wine? I believe it was real wine and Jesus was drinking wine. How can you prove something this person? You cannot convince this person against his own will. Why? Because person wants to drink whatever he likes to drink, wine, beer, and now he wants to justify his lust with the words of God. Do you think he can find here and there a couple of Bible verses to justify his lust? Sure. But that lust causes, in his mind, unbelief in the Word of God. Because then plainly written statements, he ignores them, he avoids them, and he collects only those statements which he, in his vision, sees as a proof or approves his lust, his appetite, whatever he is addicted to. There are signs we can pay attention to. The good signs. John 15, 19. John chapter 15, verse 19. If he were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. 
What is the first sign that you're on the right track? Your former worldly friends will not understand you. and says, are you crazy? It's a good sign. When they laugh at you, when they see or think that you're crazy, it's a good sign. You're on the right track. You must, be, you must be doing something what they don't do. Something what they don't appreciate, something what they don't understand. Of course, I'm not talking uh, fanatical side of Christianity. Uh, that's another really crazy thing. I'm talking when you begin to follow Christ and you begin to quit smoking, quit drinking, quit, quit eating something, uh, quit going somewhere with uh, your former friends, uh, quit watching something what you used to watch with your friends, or quit uh, certain uh, dances, music, or whatever, something, what you used to do with the friends. He says, what's wrong with you? Come on. If they say, what's wrong with you? It's a good sign. It means there's something is right going in your heart. I would like to end this study with a little illustration. A true believer, a true Christian, who lives in this world, is like a ship sailing on the ocean. Not that water which is outside the ship, will sink the ship. Actually, the water which is outside the ship causes the ship to float. But the water which gets inside the ship causes the ship to sink. We are in this world. Even Jesus was praying. I'm not asking you, Father, to take them from the world. But, being in the world to be protected from world being inside of me. The world outside of me, only when I'm with Jesus, only will help me to be above it. The world will make me float on the world, above this wickedness of the world. But if the world gets inside of me, if I have a broken ship, then it will cause my sinking. May God help us to understand this precious truth. My dear brothers and sisters, love not the world. But, as we were reading the key words, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Amen.